that you think me do. Um, okay. So, yeah, uh, I think I've already been introduced, but uh, my name is Moaz Daywood. I'm a MD PhD student from Houston, Texas, Baylor College of Medicine. Um, and today I'll be talking about using multiplex functional data to reduce the VUS burden in populations underrepresented in genomic medicine. So this is a project that actually came out of AVE, the Office of Variant Effects, uh, specifically the Outreach, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. Um, so yeah, here we go. So I think this audience is very familiar with MAVES, uh, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, you know, part of the kind of magic of MAVES is that you have this ability to experimentally make and express all possible single variants in a target. And then, you know, you can select, you know, using a clinically relevant molecular or cellular phenotype, you know, how to, you know, test each of these variants to understand what their variant effects are. And then as you have this mass subpopulation that reflects those, you know, perturbations, you can then read that out with next generation sequencing. And so effectively what you have is a high throughput way to score every variant effect simultaneously. And so, uh, you know, this high throughput, uh, you know, scoring method gives you a numerical score and, you know, functionally in terms of the experiment, you can understand it as like wild type or loss of function. Uh, however, what's really critical here is that you can also use these scores within the overall American uh, College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, uh, you know, clin clinical variant interpretation guidelines. And so, you know, functional scores is one line of evidence amongst many lines of evidence within those clinical guidelines. And you can you know, use that, use these functional scores within a calibrated framework to then say, you know, for variant one, it was a loss of function variant, and variant one is currently seen clinically as a variant of uncertain significance but with the addition of this new line of evidence saying that, you know, this variant experimentally is also a function, we actually can reclassify this VUS to likely pathogenic or likely benign. Pathogenic being more harmful, or benign being, uh, you know, less harmful. And so the idea here is that we're using this multiplex functional data to reclassify VUS. However, what's, what's really important here is understanding kind of logistically what, what exactly this means. So, um, what I have here, I'm showing you is the end terminus of the BRCA1 exon 3 locus. And so here's the boundary between the exon sequence and the intron sequence. Here's kind of the genomic coordinates on the X axis, as well as the alternate base on the Y axis. So each of these floating bases is the wild type sequence or the reference base. And the reason they're floating is because they're in that scheme of the variant effect map, where if you want to know kind of at this 790 position, what does a G to C look like? you know, you would look at this box right here. And for example, if you were to fill in this variant effect map with known data from clinical sequencing, so for for example, what you might find in the clinical variant database or ClinVar, you can see that this variant effect map is somewhat filled. There are known benign variants here. There are known pathogenic variants here, but also mixed in are these variants of uncertain significance or conflicting variants. And that G to C that we were talking about is missing. So there's a lot of missing data and there's a lot of uncertain data from just clinical sequencing alone. However, if you were to make this variant effect map based on MAVE data, so here I'm showing the exact same BRCA1 exon 3 locus, but now filled in with saturation genome editing data for BRCA1 from the Finley et al. 2018 paper, you can see every position here has a functional score. Every variant has an experimental readout. And these experimental readouts can be used within the clinical framework. Well, the word that is, you know, comes to mind here is that this variant effect map that you get from a MAVE is saturated. And this led us to this hypothesis of the saturation nature of MAVEs, you know, should produce variant effects. And these variant effects should be for VUS and individuals of non-European like genetic ancestry, because you're producing experimental scores for every possible variant in your target locus. So if there are any VUS from individuals of non-European genetic ancestry or European, you are producing experimental scores for those VUS. So could the incorporation of MAVE data lead to VUS classification in individuals of non-European like genetic ancestry? And then can you retrieve one step further, which is can you use that MAVE data to reclassify more VUS from individuals of non-European like genetic ancestry relative to European like genetic ancestry and actually compensate for that known VUS disparity? So this is where I want to start, is that there is a VUS disparity between individuals of non-European genetic ancestry versus European-like, meaning that typically in the clinical genetic space, 
when you get like an individual patient, their report back when this patient is usually of a non-European background has many more VUS on it compared to your patients that may be from your European background. So that's what this VUS disparity looks like on an individual person basis. And at scale, it's a big problem. But first, we want to define this VUS disparity rather than kind of going on the anecdotes. And so, you know, there's a lot of folks who have, have focused on defining the VUS disparity and a lot of folks who have shown it in BRCA1 or a small number of genes or in a particular clinical lab or, you know, all the data within a particular clinical lab. But we really wanted to show it at population scale. So we went and looked in multiple different biobanks. And we chose these three in particular, all of us version seven, Nomad version two, Nomad version three. And the reason we chose them is because not only were they population level data, population level biobanks, but they actually had an equi roughly equivalent number of individuals from a European-like background versus non-European-like background. And this allows us to have you know, reasonable numbers on both sides to actually make fair statistical comparisons without extra levels of inference. And I should say up front here, you know, what we're using to uh, you know, classify uh, these individuals from the population databases into their different uh, ancestral categories is actually based on a calculated genetic ancestry. And these groupings, these descriptors are as reported by all of us in NOMAD, and we're doing this for consistency's sake. And we're actually combining individuals that are classified as you know, non-European-like to improve that statistical power to you know, create a group of individuals of non-European-like genetic ancestry that is an equivalent number to individuals of European-like genetic ancestry. As you say, you know, these calculated genetic ancestries are not fully uh, inclusive and in terms of their understanding of an actual demographic of a person. However, this is how we're kind of being consistent across the entire data set. And so this is just to graphically show, you know, this big green slab here, about 50% of the data is from individuals of European like genetic ancestry. And then in cumulative, about 50% of the data, when you sum them together, comes from individuals of non-European like genetic ancestry. And this was true for all of us version seven, Nomad version two, and Nomad version three. So, you know, the Cisco method we're using here, I just want to depict it so we're all on the same page. Uh, so we're calculating something called allele prevalence. And prevalence is the clinical definition of prevalence, which in this case is the incidence of something over the total number of cases. So the incidence of that particular allele, or in this case, like the VUS allele, uh, divided by kind of the total number of, of possible alleles. And we're doing this on a gene-by-gene -gene basis. So in, in blue, you have the individuals from the non epigenetic ancestry in orange, individuals from the European like ancestry. And we're calculating an allele prevalence on a per gene basis for each of these two groups. So doing this allows us to have a, also a matched pairs testing here. And then in, in, in total, this is basically a matched pair sign rank Wilcoxon test. Uh, and the p value is Bonferroni corrected for the total number of tests that we've done in the entire study. And so unsurprisingly, we know there's a VUS disparity, and this kind of proves it at scale. There's a higher VUS prevalence in individuals of non ampn genetic ancestry across medical specialties, regardless of what specialty you're choosing, even if you're looking at, you know, the ACMG78, which is the most commonly tested set of genes. Um, and, you know, this is not just uh, true from one statistical testing perspective. We've also shown this <clears throat> we're using a second orthogonal test where we only looked at the unique variants in each of the European-like versus non-European-like groups. So there are variants that are found in individuals of both European-like ancestry and non-European-like ancestry. They're omitted from this graph. And only what remains are the variants that are exclusive to just the European group or the non-European group. And you can see here overall, you know, the way I like to think about this is that all the blue bars are taller than all the orange bars, demonstrating there's a higher unique VUS allele count here on the non-European side. And this, this disparity is true, not just for the VUS, but also for your benign, likely benign variants, for your conflicting interpretation variants, and for your variants that have not yet to be seen in clinic, the non-determinant variants. However, here, for the pathogenic, likely pathogenic variants, you can see that all the orange bars are now taller than all the blue bars. So it's reversed. So actually, there is a disparity here, but it's going the other way, which means we have a better ability to understand pathogenic variation from backgrounds of European uh, background people versus what we do for non-European background folks. And you know, if you break this down systematically back into the individual components for what we're 
grouping together is the non neurobiologic ancestry group, you can see there's a lower prevalence of pathogenic or likely pathogenic variation found in each of the non European genetic ancestry groups. So it's a systematic comparison of each group against that European genetic ancestry group. So there's nothing really here that's like pulling one way or another. It's just systematically the same across each of the groups. And so, you know, the, you know, the reason this is, is because, you know, of how we've kind of, kind of developed this professional practice and the databases and, and kind of input data that we're using here for these different analyses. So if you look here in this Venn diagram, these are the variants of no designation, meaning they have not yet been seen clinically. So there's a, a pretty reasonable overlap here, about 800,000 variants and about 1.5, 1.8 million exclusive to each side. But if you compare this overlap to the overlap amongst the other clinical categories, you can actually see the overlap is significantly bigger in each of the clinical categories and, and look at kind of this conflicting interpretations overlap. So basically what, what this is suggesting is that our understanding of each of these clinical categories is still predominantly driven by that main overlap between individuals or the variants that come from individuals of both European and non-European allergenic ancestry. And so, you know, better understanding of just that non-European allergenic ancestry would help kind of decrease these overlaps here. And so kind of coming back to the VUS point though, you know, created 84 84% of VUS in each of the medical categories are actually missense variants. So missense variants are, are a particular, particularly nasty kind of variant because it's a one base change, like a single nucleotide change. And that single nucleotide changes a single amino acid. So just one amino acid is being perturbed. And the, the holy grail question is, if you just perturb that one amino acid, is that enough to manifest clinical disease? And, and kind of what is that penetrance of that disease? And so that's why you know, so many VUS are missense variants because you know it's one amino acid amongst the entire you know uh, structure of amino acids, and it's, it's a very difficult problem. And so one of the things we were interested in is you know what is, what about that last 16%? Right, so the last 16% are all the other variants. So if all the missense variants are the hard variants, you know, putatively speaking, you'd be left with 15 to 16% of variants that are less hard, right? And so maybe there isn't as much disparity there, you know, given that 84% of the VUS or missense, and there's this huge VUS disparity. So is, is, is the main VUS disparity driven by this missense variant problem? And the answer is no. So the disparity in VUS prevalence is present even in the absence of the missense variants. So for example, we re redid that analysis of that VUS disparity across each of the medical specialties here, but black is all those coding variant alleles versus blue is removing the missense variants and the y-axis here is the effect size of the significant difference. So first of all, all these differences are still significant. On top of that, the effect size here for kind of all the, you know, the, the black bars, which contain all the alleles, you can see all the black bars relative to their blue counterparts are right-shifted, meaning the significant difference is larger when you include all, all those missense variants. But the significant difference is still large to very large for just that last 15 to 16% of variants which are putatively thought to be easier than the missense variants. So, so what exactly is going on in those variant types? Well, those variant types, so here's the missense up top, right? So the other ones here that are significant are the synonymous variants, the you know, splice region variants, the in-frame uh, uh, in variants. And, and to those of us who have spent any amount of time digging to exomes and genomes and trying to implicate causal variants and, and you know, clinical cases, we can attest to this, right? There is a small percentage of synonymous variants that are pathogenic. Splice region variants, so not the canonical splice acceptor or donor site, but the region around it, it's very difficult to know just by looking at it, is it pathogenic or not? And in-frame variants are always this, this kind of weird thing because, you know, small in-frame deletions or small in-frame insertions, they don't shift the frame. They just add a couple or a few amino acids or delete a few amino acids. So how essential were those kind of amino acids that got perturbed? And so, you know, these these variant types, in addition to the missense, are, are high priority in terms of understanding uh, the European uh, genetic variation versus the non-European like genetic variation. Now, one of the good things here is that MAVES can get all these variant types, missense, synonymous, inferring, splice region variants. And so that's what I want to come back to now is what does it take to reduce 
the U.S. disparity and kind of how do maize play a role here? So <clears throat> going back to that one word from the very beginning, when looking at that rain effect map, that word is saturation, looking at everything. And so what we did was we took three MAVs, uh, the MAVs for BRC1, 53P10, and we clinically calibrated them. And, and you know, previous work by Sean Fair and, and others have, have demonstrated that these MAVs are excellent at reclassifying the U.S. And so we automated the ClinGen variant curation expert panel guidelines for doing uh, variant classification in these three genes. So the overall clinical rules, the 2015 Richards et al., and then the subsequent follow-ups, the variant curation expert panels are gene-specific or syndrome-specific panels that take those original rules and customize them for these individual genes. So it's effectively three different rule sets, one for BRCA1, one for P53, one for P10, and these VSEP guidelines are considered the gold standard in the field. Um, and then on top of that, we also took the MAVE data and we substituted out the current recommendation for how to use functional data, and we substituted in the MAVE data that was clinically calibrated using the ClinGen Bernich et al. guidelines for how to do that. And so what I'm showing you here is now this is what happens when you uh, do the automated variant classification using MAVE data. So you have many VUS to start, and on the non-European side to start, you at 604 VUS versus 480 in these three genes in these three biobanks, and you're actually able to reclassify uh, a large percent, like over 70% of these VUS. And consistent with what we know in the field, the majority of them end up going to likely benign, uh, but there are some that go to likely pathogenic. And because these are general population biobanks, we don't think that there are as many pathogenic variants in these general population biobanks as there might be in a natural clinical lab where everyone coming in already has a high pretest suspicion for something uh, related to that disease. So doing this kind of analysis in clinical lab data may actually yield even more likely path and pathogenic variants. But in the middle here is the, the, the main takeaway of this slide, which is there is a significant difference in actually the VUS classification between the superpopulation groupings. So we are actually reclassifying more VUS in individuals of non-European genetic ancestry. And I wanna show this now in a different way. So I'm gonna use the same data, but now in the bar graph form. So at the, before using the MAVE data, before doing the VUS classification, there were 604 versus 480 VUS, non-European side versus European side. But then after, you can see we've reclassified over 70% of those VUS now 140 versus 145, but the most significant, or the, the piece that you should pay attention to is that this difference is no longer significant. And that's kind of the real killer here is that that saturation level of the data allowed us to produce all these variant effects for these VUS individuals of non-European genetic ancestry. And we were able to reclassify many of them and actually compensate for that original VUS disparity that's shown up here. Now, we had all these VUS, we reclassified all these VUS. When we had these reclassified VUS, we had the evidence codes. And so this is a very unique opportunity to understand which specific codes in the overall clinical variant classifications meant the most to the actual classification and reclassification. So what we looked for was something dubbed essential codes, meaning if you took that code out from that reclassified VUS, that reclassified VUS would regress back to being a VUS. So likely path back to VUS or likely benign back to VUS. So if you look at just the MAVE codes, right? So these are the number of, of alleles that use the MAVE code on, on both sides. And the shaded in piece is the alleles containing essential evidence codes. And you can see that about 64, 65%, which so an even percent on both sides found that MAVE code to be essential in the VUS reclassification. However, if you look at the computational predictor codes or the allele frequency codes, there is actually a significant difference, meaning that on the European side, the individuals of European like genetic ancestry found the computational predictor or allele frequency evidence codes to be more essential in the reclassification of their VUS. And actually, this is another way of representing that original VUS disparity to begin with. 
So for allele frequency, this makes sense because we know that the majority of databases out there have been sequencing individuals of European allergenic ancestry. Uh, and so there's many, many more individuals sequenced from European allergenic ancestry. So you have many, many more uh, events and under, uh, alleles from, that, from individuals of those backgrounds. But for the computational predictors, this is surprising because there are ways to control for this kind of bias. But on top of that, computational predictors also produce a saturation form of data. They also produce a variant effect for basically every variant in a target locus. And so this is disappointing to see that, you know, what we think has happened is some of these computational predictors, for example, Revel, Bazel, were trained on, you know, either population allele frequency data or clinical allele clinical data. And effectively, that data already had some kind of bias in it that is effect effectively propagated through. And this is kind of what you would consider your classic AI bias. And so these kinds of significant differences are the kinds of differences that are contributing to the VOS disparity in the first place. So in summary here, you know, we've shown there's a significantly higher pretest probability of finding a VOS or benign, likely benign variant, and significantly lower pretest probability of finding a path likely path variant for individuals of non european genetic ancestry. Overall, in the set of all curated clinical genes and all databases, there's an average of about 29.8 VUS per individual of non european genetic ancestry versus 24.3 VUS per individual of European light genetic ancestry. Uh, for VUS in these three particular genes, you know, these are the, the reclassification rates. So in total, cumulative 74%, but 77% on the non European light genetic ancestry folks versus 70% on folks from European light genetic ancestry, showing that 7% significant difference. And the computational predictor and allele frequency evidence codes towards VUS reclassification were not as equitable as we thought they would be. Um, and this is at least in part contributing to the original gap of VUS disparity for which now the incorporation of main data looks like it can compensate for this disparity. And so finally here, I just want to acknowledge all the funding sources. Uh, there's a lot of different consortia that contributed, a lot of different people and a lot of different thinking that went into this paper. Uh, shout out to my, Richard, my mentors, Dr. Richard Gibbs, Dr. Jim Lomsky, Dr. Jim Posey. Special shout out to Dr. Rene Gago Romero and Dr. Leo Scarita uh, for, for teaching me all about MIGS and uh, uh, thanks to everyone in their respective lives. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mois, for your presentation. Very interesting and important work. Uh, let's see if we have some questions. Uh, meanwhile, I have some. So the first one is, how do you calibrate the MAPES data for reclassifying variants? Yeah, so the 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 calibration itself is done through the Bernich et al. framework. And so it's a, it's a really nice flowchart. It kind of starts with making sure that one, the gene disease uh, pairing assertion, it matches what the assay is actually trying to assay. And then it goes on to more technical things like were the replicates involved, were there, um, you know, you know, good sound judgment involved in, in the creation of the assay and ha has, the particular molecular phenotype being measured, is it actually like well accepted in the field as being related to the disease? And then after that, there's this uh, calculation called the odds of pathogenicity. And so this is a mathematical formula that tells you about, um, you know, when you have your overall set of data compared to a set of controls, for example, pathogenic or benign controls from ClinVar, um, how does your, your data set perform? And so that's a quantitative way of demonstrating different thresholds of is it you know moderate evidence? Is it strong evidence? Very strong evidence. But you you for example need like a certain uh, rock curve with a particular value of A U C or something like that or so in the the Bernish et al guidelines they don't really use the the rock curve but mm -hmm. certainly A U C and and these kinds of precision recall curves and rock curves um, are are well accepted in the machine learning space and. Everyone kind of does it for their MAVE as well. Um, you know, I, I think that these these curves, they, they tend to maybe not tell the full story. You know, some of these MAVEs will have AUCs of greater than 0 0.95, 0 0.98. But when, when you really set it up against the clinical data, it doesn't perform as strongly as you would expect. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is really because of the scale of the assay, right? And so uh, the scale of the assay is so tremendous that, you know, even if you... Uh, only have a few variants 
that experimentally are, are not measured correctly or, or measured with extra noise, for example, the rock curve can still look really good. But mm -hmm. when it comes down to a one-to-one -one comparison, like when you compare that variant to something that's known to be pathogenic or known to be benign, it needs to perform in that one-to-one -one setting because that's how, you know, that's what it looks like for patients, right? So um, the the clinical guidelines, the clinical framework has more of that in mind, if, if you will. Okay, thank you. And then I have two other questions. One is, um, one of them is, how do you manage the fact that the clinical impact of a variant may be different between individuals of different ancestry? Yeah, so, um, you know, incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity and, and these kinds of hard genetic things are hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the fundamental answer is just that the, the MAVE itself, right, is one line of evidence. Mm -hmm. There are other lines of evidence within the clinical criteria, and some of those lines of evidence do pick up on certain things and certain nuances like this. And so right now, I would say um, if we just kind of cut to the chase and gloss over some of the hard details, I would say a lot of those variants that demonstrate that kind of incomplete penetrance are actually variants of onto insignificance for that reason. Um, and so it's, it's not a, it's not a uh, solved problem by any means. I think Right now, if, if folks are, you know, so I, in a different project, entirely different project, there's this variant in the gene nodal. Nodal causes, like, all your inside organs to be left-right switched. So it's a very mm -hmm. fatal disease called heterotaxy, but there are actually people who survive the entire thing, meaning their inside organs are completely left-right switched. So, like, when you go to put, like, a stethoscope on their heart, there's, like, no sound because their heart is on the other side of their chest. Yeah. So you gotta like put the stethoscope over there. Um, and so like one of my really cool findings during my PhD was I found like 17 trios that had the same one missense variant in nodal. And everyone thought it was this common benign variant, but it's actually not. It's only common in individuals of Hispanic genetic ancestry. Mm -hmm. And in basically every other ancestry, you get this variant, you get the disease. And so um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a really, you know, tough, tough world because kind of that same story that nodal g260r variant was originally called pathogenic and people did functional experiments on that in like 2009 and then over the course of the 2010s so much sequencing was done and it was found so many times that people were like no it's found too much in the population it can't be pathogenic but it turns out it's not found too much in the population it's just found in people of in hispanic population. origin mm -hmm. everyone mm -hmm. else there's no sightings of this missense variant. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a hardcore thing. And this missense variant, because of that, was called benign in ClinVar. And it might even still be mm -hmm. called benign. But we've published a paper now in the last year, and we're hoping to change that. So, yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you. And the last one is, uh, well, you already talked a, a little bit about the BEPs and that there is a bias. But you think that the improvements there will save these inequities or we should make an effort or in, in improving the maze data sets that are out there? Yeah, I mean, um, so I, 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 I would answer this maybe a little bit more macro, which is I think right now in the field, there is a huge emphasis on the recruitment of individuals from diverse backgrounds to be involved mm -hmm. in genomics and sequencing projects. And that's definitely a great move. But I think there needs to be more emphasis on this idea that that is not the only thing you can do, right? Like, yes, what led us to this problem is the fact that we didn't recruit individuals from diverse backgrounds for 20 years. So there is a reasonable hypothesis to suggest if you only fix it using this one recruitment strategy, it'll take you 20 years or more to fix it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not something mm -hmm. that, you know, um, is easy to do, right? It's like very time consuming, hard, by default requires many people across the entire infrastructure to, to kind of have their head in the game on this. You know, things like MAVES and experimental high throughput strategies, uh, not to say that they make it so that you don't have to do that hard work, you do, but this is one way to kind of get at the same problem and it's probably more cost effective. And there's definitely ways to target this to really hit the the people that really need help first. If, if there are genes, for example, that are very enriched in the US 
from individuals of mm-hmm. non-European ancestry. And so, um, you know, I, w- I would say this is like a good demonstration of that. BRCA1, T10, BPC3 are certainly three of those genes, and we're showing it can be done. I think probably the next step is for more MAVE data out there, show a similar trend, and then, you know, it'll probably just snowball from there. I think my, my assumption is that the, from, from what I know in rare disease, the majority of genes have this disparity problem. So, you know, we included in this paper like a rank list of like all the genes from the ones with the worst VUS disparity to the least, right? And and, and, and to be fair, like there are genes like CFTR, like the cystic fibrosis, mm-hmm. which predominantly affects people of European like genetic ancestry. So you see the same disparity, but the reverse, right? So that's mm-hmm. at, like the very bottom of the list because that predominantly affects people from a European background. And so, um, you know, there are ways to kind of get at this. And, and there's also real biology in here to consider uh, of like, why are certain populations being affected? What does that mean about genetic background? And so I, I think it's really exciting in general. I think people should definitely uh, use this as part of the targeting strategy.